Welcome to the Osmosis Daily Report on the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Dr. Rish Desai. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at Osmosis. I'm also a pediatric infectious disease physician, and I used to work as the CDC in the Division of Viral Diseases doing virus outbreak research. Now, before we get started, I wanted to announce that this will be the last daily update on the coronavirus pandemic. However, uh, we are going to continue to give out regular updates on COVID-19, and as things develop, we'll make sure that you're staying informed. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as check out our website and our social media platforms to get the best and latest information. Today I wanted to talk about COVID-19 and climate change. There's a great article from the United Nations on this topic and one of the key points that they make in this article is that both situations are essentially parallel in some important ways. Uh, they're invisible threats that don't respect country boundaries and require a global response. So why is it that climate change has been around for a while, we've known about it, but you don't see the panic and the collective action that you've seen with COVID-19? Well, there are some important issues that do actually distinguish them. So let's just talk about some psychological uh, differences between the two. There's a really lovely framework here that I, that I want to share with you. Uh, it's that coronavirus can be considered a present threat over which there's a great deal of uncertainty about its scale and impact but there's a significant possibility that its long-term impact is negligible. In contrast, climate change is thought of as predominantly a future threat, and you know, I think a future in quotes because it's really here already, but people think of it as something that's not really here yet, and there's this huge confidence that its long-term impact will be very catastrophic or, or very large for humanity. So COVID-19 is a big near-term threat, whereas the thought is that climate change is a big far-term or long-term threat. Now, there's some interesting ways that COVID-19 has affected climate change. In fact, satellite data of the Amazon rainforest shows that things are very dry and there's actually a risk of forest fires. In fact, because of COVID-19, uh, we've seen slashing of the environmental protection uh, budget out there. And in fact, they haven't been able to uh, do the raids that they were doing previously to avert deforestation. As a result, there's been more deforestation, land grabbing, and wildcat mining, which is where they explore oil wells and drill in areas that don't necessarily have oil fields. And all of that sets up those uh, rainforests to get burned and results in more forest fires and ash and smoke in the air. Now turning it around, it turns out that all that smoke in the air and that particulate uh, contamination actually causes worse COVID-19 uh, injuries and death. And in fact, in this Harvard study, what they found is that just a tiny increase, you know, they said uh, one microgram per meter cubed of particulate matter, very tiny little particles, uh, is associated with an 8% increase in the death rate from COVID-19. They actually looked at uh, various counties in the U.S. to create this correlation study, and that's a pretty impressive correlation. Now, there are interesting consequences that also relate to the bigger picture in the sense of fossil fuels being a big driver of climate change. In fact, there's a, an article from World Economic Forum where they essentially said the price volatility that we're seeing in oil could actually lead to major investments in renewables from these companies that want to try to diversify their portfolio. And for the first time, this is actually really interesting, some of the world's largest oil and gas companies are seeing their wind and solar assets outperform their oil assets. And of course, we know that money drives large segments of the economy. And so if that's what they're seeing, that could mean that in the coming months, we might see some more investment in renewable energy, which would be great. Similarly, we know that uh, roughly a quarter or so of our climate change is contributed to by uh, the agro-business, the meat industry in particular, but also the, the milk industry. And we've also seen that the meat industry in particular has had trouble with its uh, supply chain. A lot of that is because the individuals working in the meat industry are very close together. Uh, it's, it's very packed in tight. It's not great working conditions. And as a result, a lot of people are getting sick in those industries and can't simply show up to work. By comparison, the working conditions in the plant food industry are not at all like that. In fact, uh, people aren't getting sick in those same levels because the conditions are quite nice by comparison. And so those supply chains have been intact. So while the meat industry has been in a tailspin, the plant food industry or the plant-based meat substitute industry specifically has 
seen increases of over 200% in sales during this COVID-19 period. And, and in particular, there have been really a, a cultural shift in places like China, which is a big global meat consumer, where they're seeing more and more plant-based food consumption. And just like with the oil industry diversifying and now investing in renewables, we're seeing some of the leading meat manufacturers diversifying and also investing in vegan or plant-based meats. So that gets us to a lot of the parallels between COVID-19 solutions and climate change solutions. In fact, the UN uh, specifically urges one of their recommendations is to move to a meat and dairy-free diet. Uh, the UN specifically said that a substantial reduction uh, would only be possible if people move away from animal products. And the lead author of that UN report actually went on to say that, that uh, animal products cause more damage than construction minerals like sand or cement, plastics or metals. Uh, and that, you know, essentially uh, generating uh, meat is similar to burning fossil fuels. So the parallel here is this is a solution an individual could take on. Individual can decide what they eat and they might choose to eat more plant-based foods. Uh, on the COVID-19 side, a similar individual solution has been social distancing, that an individual can take it upon themselves to stay away from uh, other people. This week, a group of scientists got together to discuss climate change. It's called the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, and they put down a list of recommendations or solutions uh, that were mentioned in the opening remarks. And you can read through this. It's a great piece where they talk about other solutions for climate change. One of the things they talk about is that we need to get sustainable sectors in projects that help with environmental and climate. So sustainable energy in, in, in particular is one of these, and that's something that companies can do. The correlate to that on the COVID-19 side, I would say, would be testing. That's something that companies can do. Obviously, individuals can't do that, and, and companies have been stepping forward to fill the gap with testing. Similarly, on this side, uh, it would be sustainable energy. Further down in the report, they talk about something governments can do. And here they talk about the importance of carbon neutrality by 2050. That's a government mandate that they want people to adopt. Uh, on the COVID-19 side, a government mandate might be something around what the FDA can do with their emergency use authorizations. So again, at every level, individuals, companies, government, you see there are correlates between how the solutions can filter down into each of those three buckets. Finally, with unemployment on people's minds, what about jobs? And here there is another correlate uh, with climate change. The area or the sector where there's going to be massive job growth are going to be green jobs. With COVID-19, the sector that needs uh, and, and requires massive growth is healthcare jobs. So there are jobs to be had in both of these fields, and that is part of that solution, is getting human beings out there working in these fields to help us get to a better place. Now, the final point I want to end on is that we've seen with COVID-19 that the environment has the capacity to heal. This is a picture of New Delhi uh, taken before COVID-19, before the isolation order. And you can see that as people stayed indoors, didn't drive their cars, didn't burn those fossil fuels, you can see there's a dramatic difference in what things look like. This is the same exact spot, but taken now with people essentially off the streets and, and, and not doing human activities, you see the skies just clear right up. This is another before and after. So this is when people were out and about uh, doing their normal business. You can see how terribly uh, smoggy the, the sky is. And you can see with uh, some weeks of social isolation and less cars on the road, how much better the sky looks. Immediately, people are able to kind of see that difference and, and breathe the cleaner air, which again helps you with COVID-19, as I mentioned before. And the animals are returning as well. And so this is a, a beautiful site where you're seeing sea turtles on beaches that used to be frequented by tourists, and maybe therefore the turtles weren't feeling comfortable or safe going there. But wildlife is returning to areas that previously were just you know, off limits because there was just way too much human activity. You see a dolphin here. Uh, this is a, a whale shark. Just, just amazing to see this now. And we're seeing this all over the world. Mm -hmm. So thank you once again for tuning in to these daily updates. It's been a pleasure uh, participating in them with you, and I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, again, we're going to continue to give you updates. Just check out you know, our YouTube channel, our website, and our social media platforms for those. Uh, in the meantime, you know, please uh, click on the red subscribe button and the bell icon to get updates, and check out our osmosis.org slash COVID-19 resource page. Remember, we're all in this together. Please remember to do your part to help flatten the curve and raise the line. Really appreciate it. Be well.